If you've ever missed the backdrop videos, well, we got a little throwback for you today. In every way, it, it's hard for me to do a video on a rifle that is still in active military service. And we're talking about the M4A1 right here. Um, it's really hard to talk about the impact this weapon has throughout the breadth of its service. It has been long, and although the M4A1 is technically slated to be replaced in the future with the XM7 as it stands right now as of this video, I think you're gonna see the M4A1 in service for a very long time. That's due to its longevity, the amount of upgrades it's had, and how effective it's been in the entirety of its military service. So today, we're going to be doing our best to do a review of the M4A1. We're going to be talking about the history and the improvements that the M4A1 um, offered to the firearm world at whole, and hopefully you get a better understanding of the absolute powerhouse and perhaps one of the deadliest service weapons that the U.S. has ever fielded. Um, help you understand it just a little bit better. Today on Grand Thumb, stay tuned. But before we get into it, we of course have to thank the biggest sponsor of our channel. So the biggest sponsor of the channel is the Sonoran Desert Institute. If you're looking to get your start in gunsmithing, they are the people to go to. We cannot thank them enough. No Charles here today to mess it up for me and then he hops in or something. But uh, yeah, they're awesome. Go check them out. They've been supporting us for a long time. We can't thank them enough. And of course, we cannot forget primary arms. If you're looking to get optics, if you're looking to get tons of other cool stuff, go and check them out. They're peanut butter... Uh, compact one to eight is out and we are big fans. Go check them out. A big thank you to them. If you're looking to dry fire, we love Mantis. Um, I can't say enough good things about the system. It can both simulate recoil, show you where your shots are going. If you aren't dry firing, you're probably uh, not doing it right unless you're getting like a bajillion rounds for free or you're just rich enough to, to do it. But uh, here in Grantham, me, our crew, Micah, um, Charles, especially, we do a lot of dry fire. It's something that you can do in your off time. Highly recommended. Go check out Mantis. They are definitely the people to go to. And unlike the camera that this is filmed on, the TV you're watching this on, AAC Ammunition is made in the U US of A. We love them. We thank them so much. In fact, all of the ammunition used in today's video is from AAC. So go and check them out. Ladies, gentlemen, my often forgotten, but most certainly not by me, Mark18 Mod Zeros. Welcome to the channel. So before we get into it, we're going to do what we always do, and that is our full disclosure. What is my relationship with Colt? Uh, nothing. In fact, I don't think Colt even knows who I am. Not that they really make any cool guns anymore because they've really fallen behind. However, man, they did a lot in the 90s, so we really have to thank them for all that work they did back then. But in any case, um, this rifle was purchased by me. Um, the upper is actually a completely clone correct upper from Thoroughbred Armament. Um, they are our go-to for all kind of clone type military builds that can find the weirdest stuff. Um, we do have an LMT M203. It is an actual M203 40 millimeter. The lower is an actual Colt M4A1 marked lower. Um, this is um, about as clone correct as you can get. Again, this is all from Thoroughbred. We have to thank them for, uh, you know, sourcing all the components for us. So with all that being said, um, let's go ahead and go to get into it. Uh, this Obviously, I carried the M4A1 for a long time in my military service. Um, so it, it must be noted that perhaps I'm a little biased because I, I carried it for so long and I trust it so much. Um, we have to give credit where credit is due. Um, I am one man. I am not a uh, uh, an expert in the history of the M4A1, but I've been lucky enough to talk to people who are. So we have to give a big shout out, as we always do, to NSW Crane for taking the time to talk with me um, to explain some of the history that they saw on the M4A1 and a lot of the upgrades. We have to give a big thank you to a lot of the SOCOM armors at many different units. Again, these guys can't be named but um, I stand on the shoulders of giants where they let me talk to them for such a long time and pick their brain about these really important topic topics. And then of course, um, a big shout out to Small Arm Solutions if you're not familiar with this channel. He is an absolute guru when it comes to the history of all things M16, M4. Um, he is uh, extremely brilliant. I've read a lot of his books. In fact, um, very heavily read America's Rifle. Um, his book is very illuminating on the history of not just the M4, but everything. So again, credit is given where credit is due. Um, very thankful to those men for taking the time to talk with me and putting out great material on the M4A1. So with all that being said, let's get into it. When I first entered the military in 2010, the first rifle that I was issued was an M16A2. Use it through basic training. After that, I never saw an M16A2 um, again, or an M16 in general, until uh, 2018 when I saw Marines uh, using them. Marines always just getting the, the old shit, but you guys know it, you guys get it done. Um, besides that, almost every single member of the military I saw 
had an M4, an M4A1, or some variation thereof, including the Block 2 or URGI variants. So in every way, the M4A1 is the main rifle of the United States Armed Forces. And if you're not familiar with what the M4A1 is, the M4A1 is a safe semi-auto. It fires a 5.56 by 45. Um, it is air-cooled, uses a direct impingent system. It is magazine-fed, magazines typically holding 30 or more rounds, depending on what type of magazine that you're holding. And it is an awesome, awesome weapon. You really saw its debut around 1994, although development for the M4 uh, started technically was started technically by Colt in about 1984. That being said, we have to note that when it comes to the M4 and the M4A1, that really there have been short variants of the M16 for a long time, from the CAR-15 to the XM177E1s. Um, these have been fielded. The M4A1 is, just, I would say, perhaps one of the first very successful rifles that was shortened, um, and it was successful for a lot of reasons, and a lot of those reasons are really taken for granted now, because they're so standard on AR-15s that it's, it's what we expect. But all these small incremental increases um, when it comes to reliability that were done on the M4A1 to make it more reliable have bled over into the civilian world and uh, with even more developments now. But we really have to thank the M4A1 for making, in my opinion, the AR-15 what it is today. So with all that being said, let's get into a little bit of the developmental history and a couple of the things they did on the M4A1 to make it super duper ultra <laughs> reliable. So I think the most interesting thing when it comes to the M4A1 is when it was first designed, it was not conceived to be a frontline troop weapon. When they first were designing it, they're like, hey, this is going to be for support troops. This is going to be for rear echelon guys, just a lighter rifle that can carry around. And uh, therefore, we need to have maximum parts compatibility with the M16 family of rifles. However, that's pretty difficult because when you shorten a barrel and you shorten the gas system, the pressures within the system become exponentially larger. So to be able to have the same receiver extension, the same um, extractor kind of setup wasn't really feasible. So eventually this was shifted over to more of a performance design because very quickly the end user of the M4 switched from rear echelon to special operations, to elite airborne units. And it was quickly realized that a lot more needed to be changed to make this a truly great rifle. And what's really funny to me about all of this is th this is not the first time that the U.S. has made a carbine with the go goal to be a rear echelon weapon where it served on the front lines. The M1 carbine very famously was made to be a support weapon, and yet it found itself very quickly on the front lines because it's a handy, lightweight weapon, and typically the soldiers appreciate that. Even though this particular guy right here is pretty heavy, the M4A1 in general is very lightweight in comparison to the M16, and especially compared to many other service rifles out there. So one of the first things you have to understand about the development of the M4 is that there are two main rounds that were in use by the United States military when the M4A1 was developed. We have the M193, which is a 55 grain projectile, and we have the M855. Most of you are familiar with this. This is the quintessential green tip round, which really sucks. But being that green tip was gonna be the main round that was going to be used, the M4A1 and M4 were designed to be able to use this. And the first thing that they realized was that the M855 did not want to feed into the barrel of the M4. Eventually, this was corrected by changing the angle of the feed ramps as well as extending the feed ramps down onto the upper receiver with what we now know as the M4 feed ramps. This is now a standard feature in all AR-15s, and this was a small increase in the reliability of the rifle. Now, of course, with the M855, it made it very reliable, but when we expand this onto the AR-15 in general, this is something that is just standard that came from the M4. So again, Colt engineers really getting it done. Another problem that we ran into was due to the fact that the M4 is a much shorter gas system, much higher pressure. As the bolt was coming forward, it had a tendency to bounce before it seated all the way. So if you're firing in full auto or three round burst, what happened was as it would bounce, that hammer would come up and hit the bolt carrier as it was still bouncing back. And a lot of the energy was transferred into the bolt carrier trying to push it forward and then you had a light strike and that would cause a malfunction, making this a slightly more unreliable weapon. This was solved with what we now know as the HH2 buffer system, which is a tungsten carbide weight with two steel weights that are essentially free floating in there. If you shake them by your head, you can hear them going chick, chick, chick. <laughs> That's exactly what they sound like. And so essentially what's happening is as they are coming forward, they're held to the rear by the force as they're moving forward on that buffer. And when that buffer, when that BCG comes all the way forward, those weights slam forward and stop that bolt from moving so much. Obviously, there are now better systems in place, such as the Volta 5 But at the time, it was a huge boon in the reliability 
when it came to the M4. Now, I remember very specifically in my military career when we were issued an M4. It was kind of cool. It was a big deal. But um, it should be noted that our M4s were super unreliable pieces of junk. So although there was a updated extractor that went with the M4 that was adopted in about 2003, um, it, the dissemination of those parts to the, to the military, you have to understand that the military is a government entity. There's a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of waste, mismanage, misuse, and all that kind of stuff. We didn't see those extractor upgrade kits till around 2013. And when we saw those, uh, it was incredible how much better the our M4s worked. So essentially, the extractor upgrade kit was a different spring. And the big thing was an O-ring. So you could take that O-ring, place it under the, under the extractor, and this, was incre this would increase the force fourfold, um, holding the extractor onto that rim due to the increased speeds and the increased cycling rate on the M4A1. This was huge for the reliability. So when we take the M4 feed ramps, we take the H and H2 carving buffers, and we take the upgraded extractors, we have a much more reliable system. All this stuff is now taken for granted, but you have to understand this led to a very, very reliable weapon compared to even the M16 or the earlier M4 models. And what's really interesting about this is um, a lot of these upgrades as they occurred, um, I would say completely changed the rifle and yet it was still called the M4A1. So you could get an M4A1 with a lot of the older stuff on it and, and have kind of an unreliable rifle or you could get one with all the upgrades and be good to go. That's kind of how the military just works. Welcome to the government. So at this point, we've talked a lot about the development of the M4A1. What I wanna do now is talk to um, what we always do, which is going to be tip to butt. Talk about the entire rifle and talk about the upgrades that were done there and some things that were seen in the service. So we're gonna do what the Navy loves, go tip to butt. So starting here at the very tip of the M4A1, what we have is the bird cage flash hider. Um, it should be noted that the bird cage flash hider in general was invented way back in the Vietnam War, but the A2 bird cage added the little closed version on the very bottom to ensure you weren't kicking up as much dust as you're firing. Although there are much better flash hiders available now, um, almost every flash hider is judged against the A2. It is considered a standard. If you are worse than the A2, you're considered pretty shit. Um, so is it the best? No, at the time it was really good and it is still a standard that we all hold every flash hider to. So with the A2 birdcage flash hider, of course the biggest problem was suppressor mounting. There are suppressors that work on the A2, um, such as the NT4 and a couple others, but um, it, it's not the best lockup and it's not the best system. This has of course been rectified in further designs uh, such as Surefire and many others, but A2 birdcage. Now going back to the barrel. The barrel on the M4 is really interesting for a couple different reasons. The biggest one is inadvertently, the M4A1 ended up with one of the best military barrels that transferred over to the Block 2 design. So let me explain what was occurring. The M4 wasn't originally made to be used on the front lines, and yet it quickly found itself doing so. So with different special operations forces as they were pulling out of an area, they had to maintain heavy amounts of fire. So as they peeled back, they were typically firing full auto. So what was found is that these barrels kept bursting right behind the front sight post right here. Um, this was pretty common, so common in fact, that Colt went ahead and took a look at it as well as several other companies. And what was found was as according to uh, America's Rifle, that when you fired full auto and you're doing it pretty quickly, typically within about three minutes, you could get the barrel to hit a temperature of around 1100 to 1300 degrees Fahrenheit. At about this point, this would alter the uh, metal on the barrel and it would no longer be structurally sound. This would cause it to burst right at the weakest area, which is right behind the front sight post. So what's funny about this is they decided to, of course, make the barrel a little bit more beefy because there's not really much you can do about operators just mag dumping their rifles. It's kind of outside the operational parameters of the M4, but they're like, hey, let's see what we can do. So they massively beefed up behind the barrel and they invented what has later been called the SOCOM profile barrel. The SOCOM profile barrels are extremely strong and the bursting issue was um, actually fixed. But what's really interesting about the SOCOM is it inadvertently had really good harmonics as well. So as a slug travels down the barrel, that barrel is going to flex, it's going to whip. So harmonics is very important. The SOCOM barrel had pretty good harmonics. Obviously, newer barrels are much, much better with these newer contours. But at the time, the SOCOM was pretty damn good and this made for a very accurate rifle and it made for a very tough barrel that could go for a lot of rounds. 
So when it came to the probably best service rifle that was ever fielded, the Block II, with that SOCOM barrel and the better rail, you had a phenomenal rifle. But when it comes to the M4A1, it was a huge upgrade. But what's funny about it is that, like many other things in the government, um, an M4A1, not every M4A1 would have a SOCOM barrel. Uh, they actually didn't change the, the nomenclature for it, so it, it was kind of luck of the draw. But many of the newer M4A1s that you're seeing that are fielded from the military all have SOCOM barrels. So a nice little side, a little interesting note when it comes to the development of barrels. Now, when it comes to the length, man, I could talk about this at, at length here. So when it comes to the barrel length, here comes the autism. Um, 14.5. Why was the 14.5 decided upon as the barrel length for the M4? So I've, I've heard a lot of differing uh, accounts of why this occurred. According to NSW Crane, it really came down to the operators. And what they found was that the M16 is obviously a very quiet, very pleasant weapon to fire. Pleasant being non-suppressed. It's a very pleasant weapon to fire. And when you get down to a 10.3 for my dude to have fired 10.3s indoors, uh, not fun. So they found that the 14.5 in general was a nice kind of in-between. It wasn't too loud, and it, it was short enough that it could be easily maneuvered through buildings, and this was eventually decided upon to be the barrel length um, due to that. Now, could that be incorrect? Things can be lost to time, but this is according to several different sources. Take it for what it might be. The 14.5 just also happens to have pretty good ballistics, pretty good velocity for 5.56 five, rounds. So it's a good in-between and ended up being a wonderful barrel length when it comes to the 5.56 five, projectile. Now, when it comes to um, accuracy, uh, the M4A1 is not a free float design. You can add free float rails to it, which we'll talk about. Um, generally, the military wants around a three to four MOA gun. I found with SOCOM barrels and good ammunition, such as Black Hill 77 grain, you can typically do around 1.5 to two MOA with a good shooter. Obviously, more modern AR-15s have been designed to shoot far better, but the M4A1 was really good for its time, and it still is. Now, this video is brought to you by Manscaped.com, a global brand that is disrupting the grooming community. Now, what's funny about Manscaped is I've actually used Manscaped way before they ever approached me about doing an ad. So when they're like, hey, do you want to do an ad for Manscaped? And I was like, hell yeah, I want to do an ad for Manscaped. They are on the cutting edge of men's hygiene and grooming, and I love the Performance Package 4.0. Probably one of the best package that men can get for the ultimate hygiene and grooming experience. And they're like, but I still got the answer. We're gonna talk about it. But in any case, we have the lawnmower. 4.0 right here. Let's talk about it a little bit. Now, this fourth generation electric trimmer comes with ceramic blades. That way, you're always getting a nice, close, even cut. And on top of that, you can easily be swapped out and replaced. So you can get those on the website from manscaped.com. In addition to that, it has an LED light. So if you're not sure where you're going, you can uh, find because you don't want to get lost down there. Also, with the performance package, you do get the weed whacker. This is for nose and ear trimming. If you really want to put together the complete package, guys, trimming your ear hair and your nose hair will really kind of elevate you. So go to manscaped.com and get 20% off plus free international shipping when you use the code THUMB20. Get in there, check it out. Again, that is 20% off plus free shipping with code THUMB20. All right, let's get back to the video. Now, obviously moving to right here, we do have a front sight post gas block. Um, these are older. Um, it is kind of a, a, a bygone thing, but we have a ton of M4s, therefore the front sight post does persist. It is very strong. Um, if you didn't have the grenade launcher right here, you could of course mount a bayonet on it. Um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the, with the exception that it kind of takes up that rail space when you have extended rails um, for kind of where you typically want to put your thumb for guys who are between five foot 10 and um, six foot two. So that's kind of the only annoying point about that. And we'll talk about that when we talk about various upgrades that we made of the units. But uh, it is what it is. Uh, moving back from there, what we have on this particular M4 is a CAC rail. So this is very typical. Most M4s and M4A1s were updated with CAC rails. The M4A1 has always suffered from a rail space issue. And you can clearly see it right here with a weapon that is fully set up. So the rail space that you have is just forward of the receiver to the back of the front sight post, and it didn't leave a lot of room for mounting the accessories that you typically needed. So most soldiers would typically mount a light on their weapon. They will typically need a PEC-15 or, or a PEC-2, depending on the era that you're in. So these are for night vision usage, and then the white light is for, of course, you know, daylight searches through buildings or night searches. So 
with those two added, it's kind of tricky on where you're placing your pressure pads. And not to mention that if you have a grenade launcher on there, where you put in the site, are you using the top mounted site or using a offset site? The point is, it's always been a problem on the M4A1. So we'll talk about a couple solutions there before we talk about our setup. So on our setup right here, you can see I have the pressure pad to the PEC-15 uh, simply Gorilla glued on there. So Gorilla glue along with super glue will create a very strong bond against metal. You see these on a lot of old 416s. This is an old Navy SEAL trick, which I'm sure they learned from somebody else. But I stand on the shoulders of giants. So we have that right there. We have the light pressure pad right here tucked into the rail. I'm using Velcro along with that super glue. So the idea being that if you need to activate your pack, it's pretty simple, beep, beep. And then if you need to activate your light, boop, boop, time to die. So that is how we have those two set up there. So with that being said, let's talk a little bit about some of the upgrades that we saw at different units. So I can only speak really intelligently to Aspect War, um, being that that's where I served. But depending on the unit you're at, whether you're at an ASOS or especially a lot of the uh, RQSs from the pararescue units, um, basically, if you were in an STS uh, and you were within Air Force Special Warfare, you were relegated to an M4A1. And it kind of came down to the unit as to how they upgraded those or to the armors, how they wanted to work with those units. So what you ended up seeing was a lot of units using unit funds to purchase various upgrades to their M4A1. So right here, we have a pretty typical um, upgrade that would have been done to an M4A1. This is almost a direct clone of a rifle that I had at one of the ASOSs. So this is not uncommon at all. And in fact, you see a lot of these rails in use from various pair rescue units. So um, when we talk about these rails, you could see that we're eventually, uh, <clears throat> so when it comes to these rails, you could see that we're extending past the front sight posts and we're able to get that rail all the way out to the end. Why this is nice is when you have those lights and those pecs further back, like we do on the M4A1 right here, what happens is you're gonna get shadow off of your barrel that's gonna block where your light's going to hit. It could potentially be a life-threatening situation also for the illuminator off the PEC-15 for under night vision. So by being able to get those lights further out, you don't have that shadow that makes for a much more effective weapon system. Right here, we do have a Troy rail. I'm not a huge fan of Troy, but um, there were a lot of these rails employed because they were really good for what they were. They were very easy to install. Um, a lot of the times at these units, you'd have to revert the weapon to its original um, configuration when you'd get an armory check um, because they really just hadn't figured out how they wanted to run the weapons back in the day. So we had these. Um, you also see a lot of different rails such as the CAC MREs. Um, we have the, one of those from Thoroughbred. We'll post a picture right here. Um, you should also know that there are various ergo extensions that were used. I saw those used a lot by different uh, Marine Corps Recondo units and MARSOC. So again, everybody was running into this issue where they had an M4, they wanted to upgrade to the Block uh, 2, but the system hadn't been fully put into place. So again, you had a lot of interim solutions that were made to fix a rifle that was really good, but was just a little bit short due to that rail space. So, so again, you saw a lot of interim issues that were done by the various units before they were issued Block II rifles, especially when it came to Special Warfare. Um, if you're not familiar with the Block II rifle, um, think of the Mark 18 or the 14.5 variant. Very common um, by, they, essentially you took an M4A1 with a couple upgrades and you added a Daniel Defense Rail, which was a super heavy rail. Um, in my opinion, one of the finest battle rifles to have ever been fielded by a military. Uh, the rails were extremely strong, and uh, along with the M4A1, the free float of the SOCOM barrel, you had a very accurate um, uh, weapon system that could fire for a long period of time. It was awesome. But a lot of guys didn't get their hands on those for a while, so you saw a lot of mix and match. So when I talk about the block programs, you have a block one and a block two. So when it comes to block one, it's essentially the different types of components, the different types of um, optics and, and uh, wet lights and lasers that you can mount to your rifle. The Block II program came a little bit later, around 2012, and added much more upgraded parts. So again, the military being the military, the Block II system was implemented. We had a lot of these cool optics coming down the line, such as Elkan Spectres, you had um, cooler EOTEX, you had PEC-15s and cooler lights. However, uh, guys would get these accessories without getting the Block II rifles themselves. Hence, you run to what's called like a Block 1.5. Even, even though Block 1.5 isn't really an actual designation, it denotes the Block 1 M4 being fitted with a lot of Block II accessories. This was extremely common. Um, most common that I saw this was with um, Air Force Security Forces who ran M4A1s with a lot of Block II components such as Comp, uh, comp M4s, uh, PEC 15s, or LE5 UHPs. So a very common problem in the military, um, 
it's just the way life works sometimes. So when we talk about some of those older uh, lasers, we have like a PEC-2 right here, much larger. Um, a lot of these older kind of setups, this is a Mark 18 Mod Zero. Um, point is, a lot of different stuff was done with the M4 during that time. So I've talked about that at length because I'm super autistic. But moving down, we have the M203 right here. The M203 is one of my favorite grenade launchers. I understand the M320 is a better grenade launcher in every way, but it doesn't have the vibe that the, uh, that the 203 has. So the 203 mounts onto the Socom barrel or the earlier barrels has nice little cutouts right here. This is an older mounting system. I wanted to show you this. A lot of the M4s nowadays have a quick release system. Um, it's fairly easy to install and uninstall the M203. Um, so on the M203 right here, if you want to release and you want to uh, load around in, we have this release right here, just like that. That will open it up, you can load around in, and you can go ahead and close that and you're gonna be good to go. Um, the problem being that if you have a really long round, you, you can only insert around as long as the M203 could open. So the 320 actually opens to the side that we can uh, use a lot of different rounds. So the 320 is a better grenade launcher, just doesn't look as cool. Now we do have the safety right here on the M203. If you put that up, it's down, boop, desk pop. Wouldn't that be cool if I just fired one right there? Um, how you aim it, there's a bunch of different methods. We have a ladder sight that can go on top and it is used in conjunction with the front sight post or Right here, we have some fancy ones. This one is from Knight's Armament and a big thank you to them for providing it for this video. And what you do is you're able to aim by putting at the distance that you want to fire at. So if your target is at, let's say, uh, we'll say 200, we're gonna put it to that 200 mark right there. And then you're going to look through that sight until it is level and you can see the dot on the target and that will angle your 203 just perfectly. There's a little bit of zeroing that comes into play. And again, different types of projectiles are gonna fly a little bit differently. But in general, it's a very accurate system. Most guys I know typically use the ladder sights just on top, but I wanted to show you guys a couple different options when it comes to the M203. So moving back from there, um, what would be considered typical, but the time wasn't. So we have the M4A1 upper receiver right here. So talking about the bolt a little bit. So the bolt on the M4 is pretty cool. Just like your typical M16 with an upgraded extractor, which you now see on all AR-15s. But um, at the time, the M4 was pretty notable for having a very long service life. So the M16 would notably take a bolt to around 25,000 or even more rounds, depending on the firing schedule. This is something that's unknown. If you're mag dumping every day, full auto, your bolt's not gonna last nearly as long, neither will your barrel. But with the M4, it would typically be 20,000 to 25,000 rounds before you'd have a bolt breakage. This was considered pretty incredible by the government who only required 6,000 rounds before a bolt to last. So when a lot of upgrades were initially made by Colt and various other manufacturers such as um, LMT to make the bolt even stronger or better, these were rejected by the government. They're like, hey, this is already going over 6,000. This is awesome. Obviously, as we've entered into the global war on terror, and you've seen a lot more bolt breakages due to the intense firefights and the uh, ambient heat level being so much higher. These um, designs have been implemented and you do see a lot of um, newer, pretty forward thinking bolt designs that you see out there. I'm not gonna talk about them all other than to say that um, it's, it's interesting to note what was considered acceptable um, versus kind of what the reality was once the wars occurred. In any case, um, the M4 is, a, is fairly easy on your bolts, um, even by today's standards. Obviously, we know when we move to a mid-length gas system that the bolts can last even longer, but when you go down to the really short weapons, like the earlier Mark 18 Mod Zeros, those were incredibly hardened bolts and would typically break them in about six to 7,000 rounds. So the M4 is a fairly robust system. So moving down from there, we do have the magazine. So it's using your typical Stenag mags. Um, these work great so long as you're running good followers in them. Probably one of the best um, things that we ever saw happen to the M4 system in general was the Magpul Anti-Tilt Follower. That has done more for the reliability of the M4 or the M16 perhaps than any other invention. So right here, we have a OK Industries because they're super OK uh, magazine. It does have a Magpul Anti-Tilt Follower and this has been absolutely phenomenal. You saw a lot of these Stenag mags back in the day being taped up. Those are for several different reasons. One was that you could add a loop of string. This would be a old Magpul back before Magpul was a thing because a lot of those older pouches, the Alice's or, or what have you, had the magazine sitting pretty deep into the into the pouch itself. So having the little loop that you could grab onto and pull the magazine out was super helpful. Um, nowadays, we have all these high-speed pouches, you know, you need that stuff. 
But if you didn't want to do that, the tape, which is actually 6969 from 3M, nice, um, adds a little bit of grip to the magazine and also is a way to mark your magazine for yourself or mark different types of ammunitions. So we have the magazines right there. Now, obviously, there have been a lot of upgrades and a lot of different magazines that have been designed. Another big one, of course, was the Magpul magazine itself. Um, these were eventually adopted by the Marine Corps and did a ton to enhance lethality of the weapon. So a lot of the Marine M4s that you see are running these 10 P mags. It's a very Marine Corps setup right there. And they are absolutely wonderful. So with all that being said, let's go ahead and do what we always do. We're gonna go ahead and go set the trigger together. So in this particular guy, we do have a Geisley Super Select Fire, which is an actual military trigger. Um, it is simply a Geisley SSA that is uh, super fun because it goes super fun mode. So let's go ahead and let's try that out. We're gonna go ahead and double check that. That way I don't roast around through the ceiling right here. And let's put our finger on that trigger. Let's feel into it. A little bit of play, barely a let off. Let's feel that reset right there. It's a nice trigger and we can't show the other mode because stupid rules. But um, the Geyser trigger is awesome. The standard M4 trigger, not as nice, typically about a five to six pound pull. But um, you saw a lot of Geisley triggers being used within SOCOM, um, within the different uh, special operations world. So a fairly common upgrade you see, that you'd see to these rifles and a very welcome one. For a moment, um, we'll talk about the optics right here. So obviously on this block 1.5, we do have an LCAN Spectre. It is a one power or a four power optic. It is pretty cool and it was really cool for its time. It is 100% outdated now, but um, still have a very uh, soft spot in my heart for them. And then of course we have the typical Matek. Um, a lot of different sites were used depending on who was issuing these to you. So as a quick note. As a quick note on the early M4s that did have the carry handles compared to the M16, their adjustments only went to 600 compared to the 800 on the M16A2s because of the fact that the shorter barrel, uh, your slug didn't go as far. As a quick a little interesting note. Now, beyond the Elkan Spectre, you did see a lot of um, optics that were typically seen on M4s. You, of course, had the EOTech, so these were a big one. This is one of the older models, the 512, um, and these were very commonly seen. This is obviously, obviously a newer manufacturer, but the point still stands. Another one that you saw was, of course, the um, ACOG. Now, uh, this one is on a Unity riser. It is super cool and high speed. But on the issued M4s that we had, we had a Su-237, which was essentially a tan ACOG um, that had a top-mounted armor Type 2. And then offset off of that were iron sights on the left-hand side. I will show a picture right here of one of my service rifles. And uh, they were pretty awesome. ACOGs are great. <clears throat> so right here, we're going to show it on the Mark 18 Mod Zero. Um, this is, again, a Colt M4 lower, but you can see that we have the older grip right here, the old A2 grip. Not a big fan of it, in my opinion. Um, there are much better grips out there, and these are easily changed, and these were typically uh, changed on all the rifles that I saw that we had at our unit. It does work. It is what it is. Now, moving back from there, I do want to talk a little bit about the receiver extension. Now, we do have the older M4 buttstock right here, and we have a mix right here because we have a Volter um, A5 system. So the Volter A5 system is a rifle link system that allows for better recoil control when it comes to these uh, shorter guys or just to ensure the bolt's gonna last a little bit longer. But when it comes to our M4 in general, um, uh, a big upgrade that you saw was a lot of people using these old saw mod stocks right here. Now this is a B5 stock right here. They're awesome. We have compartments right here on the side that allow you to put batteries in there or Skittles or you know whatever you need to survive. So that is kind of the general setup. You see that much like um, one of my service rifles, I did change the grip to a much better angle. This is one of the Magpul grips and they are awesome. At the back right here, we have one of the QDs, the old QDs that you'd see for the hooks on those older slings. And essentially, you have your M4A1. Man, it's so hard to sum it up. The M4A1 in, in every single way impacted AR-15 design. Um, the super duper reliable, you know, BCM or Geisley, uh, you know, weapon that you have now owes so much to the M4A1 and all of the improvements that they made. The M4A1 probably compared to so many service rifles at the America's field is probably one of the deadliest. So this is due to many factors. This is due to the optics that it can mount. This is due to the maneuverability. This is due to the widespread use. The M4A1, um, also the Block II, um, which later evolved into URGI. Many could argue kind of a different rifle at that point, but it has seen so much action over the last 22 years and we'll probably see more action in the future as the world continues to crumble. So 
when we talk about the M4, we, we talk about just a phenomenal rifle. A very reliable system, a very handy weapon, a very simple to fire weapon, and more importantly, a weapon that just tends to not recoil. Very easy to control, just a great rifle to put in the hands of just a general military force. And especially when you put that in the hands of a very trained and skilled operator who can control the recoil even better, you have a very, very effective weapon in every single way. The biggest hurdle for the M4 has been due to the barrel length. The M16 was originally designed with a 20 inch barrel. Uh, 5.56 very heavily relies on velocity to be deadly. So when it came to the M193 and the M855, those projectiles performed very poorly in the M4. And you saw a lot of reports about the ineffectiveness of this particular rifle or even of the M16 with M855. As the global war and terror kicked off and as different rounds were developed, anything from Mark 262 to Mark 318, to um, all the different rounds you saw out there, the 70 grain uh, sauce rounds, the uh, TSX rounds, especially as we've now adopted a new round, which is the M855 Alpha 1. So with these rounds, they've increased the effectiveness of these 14.5 barrels. Uh, what used to be a problem with these newer rounds is no longer, and you have a very effective, very deadly weapon system. And I can't say enough good things about the M4. Obviously, there are much improved versions we have the Block 2, we now have the URGI, and I'm sure we'll have something else that is an AR variant before the XM7 really gets its foothold in the military, if it does. So, I hope you guys have enjoyed a lot of my uh, autistic talk about the M4 and the M4A1. It is one of the uh, my favorite <laughs> rifles. It just looks super cool, uh, and it really holds a place that is near and dear to my heart because of the amount of time that I've spent with it, both in the military and without the military. We owe so much to this weapon. Hope you guys have enjoyed this. As always, I'm gonna say one thing. I don't care what rifle you have, please train with it. Please have one that is reliable and trained. Uh, more so now than ever, we need men of, of, of strong moral character to be training and to be ready for no particular reason. So get out there, train, be ready. We appreciate you guys so much. And now we got nothing else for you. Final thing for you guys, <clears throat> that advice. So there's no greater form of rebellion right now than having a family and raising kids. So get out there, get to it.